Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to all of those of you around the world who are joining us today and, and here in the United States. Uh, my name is Jamie Horsley, and I'm a non-resident senior fellow at the John L. Thornton China Center here at Brookings. Uh, and I'm also senior fellow at the Paul Tsai China Center up at Yale Law School. On behalf of my colleagues at Brookings, uh, I'm thrilled to welcome you to today's very timely and important event. As we here in the United States are digesting and waiting for some of the final results of our midterm elections, um, we hope here to shed some light for you all on Chinese style elections, the election of the new party leadership at the recently concluded 20th National Congress of the Chinese Communist Party. It produced a new party leadership lineup and the policy framework for the next five years. As expected, Xi Jinping was reappointed for a third term as both general secretary of the party and then head of the Central Military Commission. And he seems set to be elected as well uh, as the president or head of state uh, of uh, China in March at the meeting of the National People's Congress, which is the state counterpart of the party Congress. So this meeting took place amidst very uh, turbulent times. We have a struggling domestic and global economy. China's continuing its uh, zero COVID policy that has been isolating it and its people from the rest of the world. Um, and of course, amidst the war in Europe and a sharply deteriorating uh, US-China relationship. It was also preceded by a really striking protest uh, in Beijing the week before where a lone individual managed to hang a banner from the Sichuan Bridge in Beijing uh, calling for political change, which was widely spread for a while and then around the world. And then it also involved a mysterious and totally unexpected removal of former party secretary and president Hu Jintao uh, from the final day's proceedings. However, most of the outcomes were more or less expected, uh, although they disappointed markets in China and around the world. With the leadership lineup of Xi loyalists devoid of any known reformers and no apparent new prescriptions for, to address China's economic, COVID, and other challenges. But to place these events in a little context before we turn to the panel, I just wanted to give a bit of background about the Party Congress for those of you who may not follow this. Again, these Congresses meet every five years and they primarily have three basic functions. Uh, the first is to review the work of the past five years of the party and all the achievements. And in this Congress, of course, she also looked back over his last 10 years because he's just concluded uh, two terms. Uh, and then the Congress will also establish guidelines for party work in all the major policy sectors for the next five years. And these tasks are laid out in a report that was delivered by Xi Jinping on the first day of the Congress, and then was discussed, ultimately voted on and approved the last day of the Congress. Moreover, the Congress elected a new central committee, which we'll hear more about, which in turn elected the party's general secretary, Xi, the Politburo and the Politburo Standing Committee. And then, as I mentioned again, the party Congress is followed every year by an annual meeting of the states, uh, elected legislature, the uh, National People's Congress, and that will be the 14th People's Congress that will convene in March uh, to announce the state leadership. Now, most observers found the results of the party Congress, including the leadership lineup, to be depressing and even alarming in some cases uh, because of its implications for the economy and investment for China's foreign policy, for law and governance and human rights, and for China's trajectory generally. To discuss all this and maybe some possible other interpretations of the results, today's event will have two panels. Uh, the first will focus on Chinese domestic politics and I'll be the moderator for that. Our second panel will focus on implications for China's foreign policy and that will be moderated by my colleague, Jonathan Stromset. So please join me in welcoming the first group of panelists who will fo focus on domestic political issues. Uh, the first will be Chung Li, uh, who's director and senior fellow of the Brookings China Center and a director of the National Committee on US-China Relations, followed by David Dollar, also senior fellow at the Brookings China Center and host of Brookings uh, trade podcast, Dollar and Cents. 
And last but not least, Diana Fu, a non-resident fellow in the Brookings China Center, as well as an associate professor in the Department of Political Science and the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. We'll begin with brief opening remarks by each of these panelists, then we'll move into an open discussion and include questions from the audience. Uh, if you have any questions for our panelists, please email them to events at brookings.edu. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter with the hashtag 20th Party Congress. Without further ado, I now turn the program over to our first panelist, Chung. The floor is yours. Thanks, Jimmy, uh, for your insightful introductory remarks and for moderating this panel. First, I would like to join you in welcoming viewers from around the world to this important discussion of China's 20th Party Congress. In my presentation today, I would like to share with you three major takeaways from the leadership changes at the Party Congress. The first echo the title of today's uh, webinar, She is Sweep. Last month, prior to the Party Congress, I engaged in a fireside uh, conversation with the New York Times uh, columnist, Thomas Friedman, entitled, Will China's Strong Man Become Even Stronger? We now have a very clear answer. President Xi Jinping has completely replaced collective leadership, or what I used to call one party, two coalitions in the post deng era. One coalition of which she was a member was once led by Jiang Zemin, and the other was once led by Hu Jintao, which was mainly comprised by leaders who advanced careers from Chinese Communist Youth League's ranks, known as Tuan Pai. During Xi's first term, <laughs> He ran the country largely through his political allies on the Power Bill Standing Committee, most notably Wang Qishan, and had to work with rival Tuan Pai leaders like Li Keqiang. During his second term, uh, she promoted his two protégés, Li Zhansu and Zhao Leji, to the Power Bill Standing Committee. But his political allies like Wang Huning and uh, Han Zhen and the rival uh, Tuan Pai leaders like Li Keqiang and Wang Yang still occupied two seats each. But this time, five of the other six Power Bill Standing Committee members are Xi's longtime protégés. The other member is his like-minded political ally, Wang Funing, who has long advocated new authoritarianism as the appropriate form of governance for China. The CCP experiment with collective leadership in the post-Deng era has now been relegated to the past as ineffective and inappropriate, leading to fragmentation, vicious internal infighting, party leadership split, and the loss of civilian control of the military. Now, my second main takeaway is that economic development, while still important, is no longer seen as the top priority at the time that Xi Jinping described as involving profound changes unseen in a, in a century. National security and social political stability have unambiguously taken the driver's seat. Xi Jinping's confidant and intelligence chief, uh, Chen Wenqing, has entered the Power Bureau, a move unmatched in the past four decades. Two vice chairmen of the Central Military Commission are both known for their deep experience in military modernization and the preparation for war in the Taiwan Strait. While this priority shift from economic growth to security and social political stability may cause some concerns in some corners, both at home and abroad, this is not a uniquely Chinese phenomenon. In today's world, many countries, especially major powers, have placed priority on national security and the politics over economic development. Now, in my, if my first and second takeaway are straightforward and unambiguous. My third takeaway is more uh, paradoxical. So in a, to a certain extent, I disagree with um, Jimmy's uh, you know, introductory remark about the, all the negative uh, comments. I think, uh, now let me, you know, I wanted to, uh, I would like to elaborate on my third point. Some Chinese social media educational background and the leadership experience of most members of the new Power Bill Standing Committee as mediocre. But this generalization 
can be challenged on several fronts. If one looks at the Power Bureau and the entire Central Committee, there's an unprecedentedly high number of foreign educated retainees, internationally renowned scientists, and the university administrators. We should not miss that uh, broad trend. Some critics have expressed concerns about the lack of market reform advocates uh, in the new leadership, as uh, Jimmy uh, said in the beginning. But one should recognize that the overall economic development strategy already shifted a few years ago from single-minded GDP growth and the free market competition to common prosperity with the overarching goal of expanding the middle class. Many members of the new leadership are known for their advocacy and experience in that regard. Also, more than half of the Power Bureau members, including three Power Bureau Standing Committee members, were directly promoted from provincial chief positions. Most of them previously served as the top yeah. leaders in Guangdong, Fujian, Zhejiang, Shanghai, Beijing, and Tianjin, the most market-friendly region and the cities with strong foreign investment. Finally, as many China watchers, including myself, predicted, President Xi Jinping will not identify a successor this time because he does not want to become a lame duck during his third term, and he will likely also plan to have a fourth term. By positioning both younger leaders, Li Chang and Ding Xuexiang, in the state council as premier and executive vice premier, she has successfully prevented the public speculation at home and abroad about his possible successor. Yet, it should be noted that uh, these two younger leaders in, their, uh, in this superior decision-making body are well positioned for future succession. Also, more than half of the Power Bureau members were born in the 1960s. Among the 376 members of Central Committee, only three leaders are over age and born before 1955. They were Vice Chairman of the CMC, Zhang Youxia, Top Diplomat Wang Yi, and Xi Jinping himself. Notably, no single 7G or 7th generation leaders who are born in the 1970s is counted among the 205 full members. No single 8G, you know, 8th uh, generation so-called leaders serves on the Central Committee as an alternate. This shows that the generational transition power is still in progress because of the paramount nature of the Chinese leadership echelons in terms of age composition. It is unlikely that Xi Jinping will drop the sixth generation and look for a successor in the seventh generation or younger. Now I provided them my comprehensive assessment and the quantitative data detailing the scale and scope of the leadership uh, turnover at an event held three days after the party Congress by the National Committee on US-China Relations, the video of which can be found on YouTube and also in the National Committee's website. Over, Jamie. So that was great. Um, as I said, we might have some different alternative in interpretations of what went on and we thank you for that and we'll have questions for you later, but now we turn it over to David Dollar for some comments on economic and finance implications. David. Okay, thank you very much, Jamie. It's a real pleasure to join this panel. You know, as the economist in the group, I would say my first reaction, uh, you know, to the results of the party Congress was somewhat <clears throat> depressed. Uh, as I see it, you know, China has some uh, extremely experienced technocrats. Uh, and a striking thing is that many of them disappeared from the list of the Central Committee. Uh, so it's clear they're being pushed into retirement. And I'm thinking of people like Li Keqiang, Wang Yang, Liu He, Guo Xuqing, Yi Gang. So pretty extraordinary amount of talent uh, that seems to have been pushed aside. Some of them were pushing up against uh, you know, age restrictions, but it, it's not clear the age restrictions mean as much now as they did in the past. Uh, so I, th that was my first reaction. You know, China has some very daunting economic challenges, demographic decline, you know, real estate problems uh, that spill over into the financial system, productivity slowdown. So they certainly need some good economic policy making. Uh, and on the personnel side, it does 
seem that they have, have uh, pushed aside some of the most talented technocrats. Now, the second point I want to make is things are not so black and white. Uh, it's a nice storyline to think of Xi Jinping as relatively statist, favoring state enterprises and industrial policy, and the more market-oriented technocrats I just mentioned you know, have, have been pushed out of the leadership. Uh, so you could tell a somewhat depressing story of China likely turning away from economic reform uh, toward a more statist approach. Uh, but I think that that idea is really overdone. Uh, the world is more complicated than that. Uh, I give Xi Jinping credit uh, for having made some important moves in terms of opening up the economy over the last 10 years. Uh, China has joined the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which is the biggest free trade deal in history. Uh, they've negotiated this investment agreement with Europe that's on hold for the moment, but could easily come back within the next couple of years. They've applied to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, so in terms of their actual uh, external policy making, you know, I would say things accelerated. L liberalization actually accelerated to some extent uh, under Xi Jinping. So it's not it's it's not such a simple story of um, you know of statism uh, versus market oriented reform. In the report that Xi Jinping made at the beginning of the Party Congress, there was a fair amount of material about continuing to open up the economy. And they use the phrase high quality opening. Uh, you know, the devil, of course, is in the details. So it's not it's not clear to me exactly what is high quality opening versus low quality opening. Uh, I, I'm hoping that following through on the Trans-Pacific Partnership would be an example of high quality opening because that's a trade agreement that that sets standards and addresses issues like investment and intellectual property rights protection and trade and services. So. So I do think it's a complicated moment uh, where lots of forces are going to be pushing China to open up more. And certainly Xi Jinping and this new leadership, they want to see the economy grow well. There's no way to expand the middle class without having the economy grow uh, consistently well for another few decades. Uh, but on the other hand, it is a little discouraging to see the seasoned reformers on the Chinese uh, side essentially pushed out of the leadership. And then the third point I make, Jamie, is just that there is something of a contradiction uh, between uh, pursuing the more statist approach, subsidizing state enterprises, subsidizing particular technologies with industrial policy, a lot of the, the interventions in the Chinese economy. There's something of a contradiction between that and opening up the economy. You know, because China's partners are going to want to see a level playing field, uh, and it might be attractive for China to continue to have the interventionist industrial policy in many sectors, but also have a wide open world economy where they can exploit uh, the technologies that they're developing. Uh, but China's trade partners are not necessarily going to put up with that. And uh, I, I realize our primary focus is not U.S.-China relations. But I'll just end by saying it's it's hard to see uh, a, a recipe for much better economic relations between China and the U.S. I think we'll see ongoing friction uh, between China and the U.S. on the economic side, uh, and that uh, it, that's actually a less favorable environment for China's economic development than we've seen over the past ten or twenty years. So I'm going to stop there, Jamie, and look forward to the interaction. Thank you. Well, thank you, David, for those very uh, nuanced and complex remarks. And we'll be back with you with many questions, I'm sure. Uh, but first, we'll turn to Diana Fu, Professor Fu. Uh, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Jamie. And it's nice to see a large and diverse audience joining us this morning. So as a scholar of contentious politics and civil society, I want to offer a societal angle on the 20th Party Congress, and specifically from the perspective of people inside and outside China who may be unhappy with the regime and its policies. So in the lead up 
Um, two, and in the aftermath of the party Congress, there were two incidents of public defiance that were quite surprising. The first one is um, one that Jamie mentioned in her introduction, which is that there was a lone pro protester in Beijing, uh, later dubbed as the Bridge Man, who engaged in a solo flash protest of the regime and its policies. And his protest act um, and slogans were actually widely circulated in Chinese social media before the authorities censored it. Now, this first act of dissent actually inspired a subsequent um, emergence of a transnational youth movement that is still ongoing across an estimated some 350 campuses in approximately 30 countries, including in the US, Canada, UK, and other places. And this transnational youth movement involved um, students, Chinese students studying abroad who are echoing the slogans of the bridge man by sticking up posters across university campuses. Um, and their slogan is that, you know, an individual's courage should not be met with no response. So I want to talk about um, how this squares with the pattern of contention in China in, these, in analyzing these two incidents. One of the things that these two incidents share is that is their small scale. They're very small scale. Um, and this is not surprising because it's extremely risky to express public dissent in any sort of large scale way. And even in the Hu Win era, rights activists in China had to engage in what I call mobilizing without the masses. So in the Xi era, this uh, era, the scale of dissent remains very, very small. In the case of the bridge man, it was literally a single protester. And even in the case of the student protester movement, the scale is also relatively small. It's a wide geographical scope of protest, but the scope of protest doesn't equate to scale. Um, and, it, and I want to emphasize that the Chinese student movement, um, pro protester um, poster movement, isn't equivalent in scale at all to what we're seeing with the Iranian protests where tens of thousands abroad have joined in. So this, this, this small scale, as I said, is not surprising. But one thing that is surprising may be the framing of the recent dissent. And so what we're seeing in, in these recent um, two episodes is rather unbridled and blunt critique of the regime and of the leader. And this kind of framing is very unusual in the pattern of contention in China. With the exception of the Falun Gong, Chinese protesters normally have long learned to couch their grievances in the language of economic issues. We want wages, we want our land back, we want less pollution, et cetera, et cetera. And you often find normally that Chinese protesters often target local level officials while holding up banners, reaffirming their support for the central state and affirming their support for the CCP and asking for the benevolent central state to step in to intervene in whatever local affairs um, or local corruption that has resulted in grievances among the people. But this time the critique of the regime went right to the top. There's no mention of local abuse. It's directly calling for regime change and for Xi uh, to step down and with some poster saying, he's not my president, which is extremely bold and unusual. So of course these two incidents represent only the polar extremes of dissatisfaction. They're not representative of Chinese public opinion writ large, whether domestically or abroad. However, I think they give some indication of the pressure points in society um, that the beginning of Xi's third term um, should address. And the first pressure point is the frustration with the persistence of the zero COVID policy. And this is captured in the protest slogan, we want food, not, P not P PCR tests. We want freedom, not lockdowns. And the second pressure point is extensive social media censorship. After the bridge man's protest was censored, people started circulating. I saw it, we saw it. And some of these WeChat accounts that had been um, circulating these, uh, these posts were, were suspended. So ratcheting up censorship measures can increase societal frustration, especially among the younger generation. And the third pressure point relates to the economy, um, which is that the urban unemployment rate among the youth is at an all time high. According to CNN estimates, it's currently about one out of five young urban youths, um, and when I'm talking about youth, I'm talking about people between the age of 16 and 24 are unemployed. So to the extent that this is an accurate estimate, um, addressing youth unemployment is going to be key. 
Otherwise, the regime may face a, a bunch of angry young people at home and abroad, which can be a formidable social force. So I'll end it there. Okay, thank you so much for those uh, very interesting comments as well. Um, and now we'll turn to handling some questions. Um, going back to you, Chun Li, um, with your interesting take on the lineup and that maybe there's more going on in the leadership group than some analysts have recognized in the past. I wonder if you could comment on, you know, the different characterizations of this cabinet that, you know, she has put together of, of like-minded people. On the one hand, some people call it a war cabinet, you know, that they see it, you know, all yes man and they're ready to take on all these domestic issues in China as well as, as overseas. Others have questioned whether maybe what she is doing by reducing these contentions and fragmentation that you mentioned, uh, at least within his, his uh, immediate group, uh, that he's prepared now to take on you know, some of these really tough reforms like property tax and other things that he's not been able to do and go up against the vested interests. You know, Maybe going back to all those economic reform proposals from the third plenum of the 18th party Congress. Um, so I wonder if you could comment on whether you think, you know, what what do you think of this kind of speculation well, that we may uh, in fact be surprised by some of I think the, the both mm. views are, are kind of extreme and uh, the internal war cabinet, certainly Xi Jinping uh, made a, a recent speech talking about preparation for war. I mean, this is he spoke at the military, you know, uh, group. And uh, it's very clear that, uh, uh, you know, we know that the top priority shift to the national security and including prepare, uh, preparation for war over Taiwan, and uh, also the domestic stability as China so uh, you know, insightfully uh, explained the challenges, the pressure, and et cetera. So these are the, the, the major uh, uh, shift. But uh, also the other extreme think that uh, Xi Jinping will uh, you know, use this his control to carry out uh, the market reform. I think that's also groundless. I actually echo what David said early on. It's not just black and white. You know, so you will keep some of the market component, but at the same time, the industrial policy, state-owned enterprises, particularly in you know, aerospace, shipbuilding, and these kind of uh, uh, you know, so-called national flag uh, uh, ship companies, he will continue to promote. So he will target uh, some of the gigantic private companies, like he, what he did in the past two or three years with Alibaba, Tencent, Evergrande, and uh, name it. Uh, but at the same time, I think that the appointing Li Chang and some other people in important positions, these are people actually usually being seen as uh, market friendly because they work in uh, Zhejiang, Jiangsu, Shanghai, Guangdong, and especially Guangdong, Zhejiang, and Shanghai. I mean, Guangdong, Zhejiang, and Jiangsu, and also Fujian are very market friendly and to a certain extent also have a huge uh, community of business uh, uh, people from Taiwan. So in a way that uh, it's uh, not to go to the extreme uh, that the complete anti-market, I think the biggest ch challenge at the moment in the near future, also Diana, you know, actually talk about is the unemployment of young people and, uh, and also the unemployment resulting by the, uh, partly by COVID, uh, you know, a, a draconian nature of the policy that the Chinese small business are not doing well and um, huge unemployment pressure but at the same time that the economic structure change. I think that will be a challenge for um, uh, 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 Xi Jinping and Li Qiang in the next few months. Uh, so my, uh, I, uh, my view is they will start to talk about how to uh, improve in this area. Li Qiang already made a speech talk about China will continue to engage with foreign companies with, in light of some criticism and concern David uh, so rightly uh, answered. So I just want to add one thing that uh, to echo David, uh, sometimes the immediate reaction uh, uh, certainly is quite a negative that reflect the stock market and et cetera, both in China and outside China, particularly outside China, I would say. But uh, uh, this immediate reaction may change as the time goes on, people have a better understanding and the Chinese new leadership have the more exposure to the outside world. So this is my um, kind of uh, 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 hope uh, that the new leadership will adjust some of the, uh, you know, currently, uh, kind of a very negative views and prove themselves that at least in some areas that uh, they will continue to carry out some of the uh, foreign engagement and also the, 
the private sector development, particularly for small business. This is part of the common prosperity. I do not see that common prosperity is against the market. To a certain extent, common prosperity could be a, a push for three way of you know, uh, economic development, consumption, investment, and foreign trade. Over. Okay, well, thanks for that, Chung. Um, it leads me into some of my questions for David, and I had more than one. So um, since Chung sort of ended on common prosperity, um, I want to follow up and ask you about that. But the first question I really wanted, do you agree with this reading of you know, the party report and what came out of it, the economic development has been, you know, de-emphasized uh, to national security uh, and social stability, because I see them all related. And if you read the report and count words like a lot of us do, development was mentioned about 240 times, national security 91. And they said, you know, the economic development, development, high quality development, uh, still remains the priority that they have to deal with, because of course that helps ensure social stability and national security as well. So they seem to be more balanced in my view, but what is your take on it? What is, do you agree it's been downplayed now? Well, I agree with I agree with your assessment, uh, Jamie. I think, you know, I think when we get into the word counting, you know, you know probably the economic side has been downplayed a, a, a little bit, but the main thing I would emphasize is what you just said is that, you know, national security, domestic security, economics, they all go hand in hand. You can find examples of Chinese leadership talking about, you know, uh, managing the financial risks is a national security issue for China, because if they have a big financial crisis, that's going to set back their national aspirations. It's going to set back their military, et cetera, et cetera. So it is somewhat artificial uh, to divide these things up. And I, you know, I do think Xi Jinping inevitably and his uh, you know, top people, they're very much concerned with continuing to make the economy grow. Uh, the, the point about youth unemployment, I think that's very interesting. Uh, I believe it was Chung just now, you know, who was alluding to the main sources of Chinese growth have been uh, infrastructure investment, real estate investment, exports, and consumption. And of those, if you're talking about college-educated youth, they are mostly going to go to work in consumption-oriented businesses. Most consumption is services. Those sectors employ a lot of college-educated whereas manufacturing actually employs very few college educated, uh, construction, almost no college educated. Uh, so if you look at some of the traditional sources of China's growth, th they don't generate the kind of jobs that China needs now, you know, which is essentially high skilled work for college educated. So I think they, they do face a big challenge, a really interesting challenge of, on the one hand, demographic decline, you know, that the overall labor force is going to be declining. But, you know, within that, they're graduating so many young people every year that they've gotten an enormous pool of underutilized college graduates. And it would be good economics to be putting those people to work productively and uh, probably good for political stability and social stability. And that that's all about involving uh, the development of the consumer industries, you know, innovation, private sector, uh, that's where those young people are going to go to work. They're not going to go to, <clears throat> they're not all going to go to work in state enterprises. They're not going to be enough employment there. So, uh, you know, so I do think the economic agenda uh, is still, is still obviously important. And I think Xi Jinping and his top people know that. That's why, I, you know, I, I, I led with the disappointment of seeing so many talented technocrats pushed out of the leadership. Uh, but let's not, interpret that to mean that economics has gone away as a key issue for China. Okay, well, thank you so much for those very thoughtful <laughs> comments too. It's a very complicated situation China's facing as we are, are all. And I'm gonna come back to you on the common prosperity piece too, but first I wanna turn back to Diana and pick up on the youth unemployment and all that and ask you more generally, do you see anything in terms of prescription of where, what all of this means for development of civil society over the next five years. I mean, youth tend to be very involved in charitable activities and volunteering and, and could find some employment in, in NGOs if they were allowed to grow. But I'm looking at the statistics out of the Ministry of 
um, civil affairs and the number of registered NGOs is going down. Uh, yet there are other ways people can participate. So what do you kind of foresee under this new trajectory uh, as the development of civil society uh, in China? Yeah, I'm really glad you brought brought, brought up that angle, um, and Jamie, and connecting it to some of the aspirations of youth who may not want to go into either the private sector nor the uh, nor the state sector, but our youth are idealistic, right? Youth everywhere are idealistic, and um, China is no exception. And so, a lot of youth who want to craft a or want to pursue a trajectory or career in social change, whether it be working on issues of LGBTQ rights or labor rights, or media, or environment, uh, a lot of them are rather depressed because they see uh, Xi Jinping 3.0 uh, as sort of a continuation of a prolonged winter, to use an analogy, for activism. And, um, and I think that uh, their characterization of this is quite correct. Uh, we've already seen the passage of a number of regulations and laws, including the overseas NGO law of 2017, that have really restricted um, INGOs uh, that had been able to operate in China from operating there. And there's also been a tightening in terms of funding uh, to domestic NGOs, as well as, well as crackdowns that we've seen early on in Xi's term uh, across all kinds of grassroots, grassroots civil society. And so what we're seeing um, with uh, NGOs in China and people who want to engage in NGOs is they've taken up two paths. Either they've stayed in China and some of them have actually studied abroad and actually want to go back to China, even though the environment is not great. They think this is where, you know, this is my home. This is where I want to see change. So they've either stayed in China, but have had to lay low, meaning not do many activities or even find a job in another sector for now, but do some volunteerism on the side. Or they've taken a different path, which is uh, they've uh, some of the NGO um, activists within China have left China. So even those that have been able to operate in Hong Kong, they've left China. Some have left for North America, including the states, including Canada, some for Europe, while others have actually gone to Taiwan. And so what we're seeing is this sort of an exit of activism and of NGO um, of people in the NGO sector uh, from China. And if I might add a little bit more about um, how civil society is seen and talked about in the report, uh, the party Congress report, you don't see mentions of the word civil society, correct me if I'm wrong, Jamie, but um, you know, the civil society, is, it's not surprising that civil society as a word is not mentioned because it was deemed politically sensitive all the way back in 2012, 2013, uh, considered to be one of the deadly Western perils. And so instead, what is talked about is um, so what the permissible term is, is social governance, shouhui And this is what you find in the report. And shouhui um, social governance entails many different components from grid management to mobilizing community groups and individuals to participate in social governance. But I want to emphasize that this kind of participation that the state is seeking from society is not exactly public participation, public debate in, um, in, in policy issues. Uh, rather, what they're asking the public to do as part of social governance is asking the public, individuals as well as community groups, to report to state functions, report to the government on any um, elements in society that they see as um, straying or, or violating uh, rules and regulations. So I have a co-authored research on how the party state is actually using the social credit system to control civil society. And one of the mechanisms that has been installed has been setting up channels for individual people in society to actually report to the Ministry of Civil Affairs on social organizations that are suspected of being operating illegally. So that what you're seeing is uh, not just emphasis on social stability, but also an emphasis on mobilizing the public to engage in societal governance in a way that the party is able to fully control and lead. Well, I think we could do a whole new program maybe on, on these interesting developments you've been talking about. Um, but I was struck to another term uh, that you will not find in the report is the word private enterprise, you know, because they call it everything, but, you know, non-government owned and not or other terms, but, but never use the word for private per se. But obviously, uh, common prosperity has implications, you know, for youth and civil society. 
It also does for the private sector, which David, you talked a little bit about, but I wanted to ask both you and Chung um, to comment on more on this common prosperity, which is often viewed, at least from outside China, people focus on the aspect that was mentioned in the report of seeking to regulate excessive income and um, do you know and wealth accumulation? So they see it as sort of a forcible redistribution from the wealthy, mm -hmm. i.e., private sector, you know, to public. Um, I thought in the report too they were giving a much more nuanced view that that actually common prosperity involves a lot of policy things like you know uh, equal employment opportunity, fair competition, a new tax structure, et cetera, et cetera. So first, I wanted you know, Chun, you mentioned common prosperity in your remarks what you think of this policy, because you see it as a major driver now, uh, and then I'll turn it over to David for his comments. On well, we first, uh, we should uh, uh, understand the mindset of Chinese leadership. Uh, they interpret uh, what happened in the past few years, if not longer, uh, happened in Hong Kong, happened in Chile, <clears throat> happened in Paris, happened in the United States, and uh, uh, these countries uh, experienced some kind of rise or protest. Uh, they think this is a in large part is the economic disparity, and there's some super rich people, but also <clears throat> many people that are uh, left behind. So that kind of mindset uh, um, made the Chinese leadership, whether they use that excuse or really concern about the future, they think that even China has the middle class, the probably largest in the world. I mean, four hundred to five hundred million people, according to Li Feng. I mean the new uh, vice premier replacing uh, Liu He. So, but still, uh, as we know that, uh, as Li Keqiang mentioned, there's still a huge number of people, you know, uh, are really uh, just got rid of poverty, but uh, their, their income is still very, very low. So the policy wanted to uh, help these people, and super, certainly want to uh, control the super rich people, these gigantic companies, etc. Now. Uh, so that's the mindset, that's the political motivation and also economic policies. Uh, so at the moment, I think they still need to explain, still need to deliver uh, to really help those, uh, you know, uh, 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 low middle class people and, uh, uh, and also that the, the more people to join the middle class rank. It's a tough, it's a very uh, tough, uh, uh, you know, situation, especially you see that COVID lockdown and also David said unemployment, also Diana also mentioned that. But uh, that's the overall uh, thinking. But I think ultimately, probably, you know, this is uh, related to Xi Jinping constantly talk about the uh, Wang Chuxing, you should or really originally uh, think about the China's uh, you know, socialist revolution. Of course, I will not go that far to talk about communism, but uh, keep some of the socialist compassion. Uh, this is certainly, it's very much in leadership mind. So they want to restrain. They also want the rich people to have so-called the third uh, redistribution of wealth, basically to do uh, you know, uh, you know, philanthropy and many other things. And a lot of policy will crack down. So we do not expect that the past, uh, you know, during the uh, uh, Zhongji era or during even Wen Jiabao era, this kind of uh, uh, private sector, these gigantic uh, IT firms and many other things. But to a certain extent, we also see the United States, yeah, there's some control about the monopoly, you know, uh, uh, by Democratic parties mm -hmm. and also by some of our politicians. So to a certain extent, there's some similarity, but difference is China want to use the, the state power to carry out all these things. So I certainly share Diana's concern about the lack of the civil society. I think civil society can take a lot of responsibility in today's world, but unfortunately that things has been uh, marginalized over the past few years, largely because of fear of the so-called color revolution. Over. Yeah, I'll just add, Jamie, I think common prosperity is not a very well-defined phrase. And in the Chinese context, it, you could take it in a bad direction or you could take it in a good direction from the point of view of economic policy. The, you know, the bad direction is beating up on the rich and, and making it discreditable uh, to you know, be innovative and successfully develop a big firm and earn a fortune, uh, and I think that yeah, yeah, that's really uh, put a, something of a chilling wave on the whole innovation environment in China. But turning it in a good direction would involve more systemic change. You mentioned, I believe, the property tax along the way. You know, it's really pretty outrageous that China doesn't have a significant real estate tax, which of course would affect the billionaires. 
but it would affect lots of ordinary upper middle class people as well who own multiple apartments. And just more generally, there's not that much taxation of capital in China and not that much taxation of the wealthy. Uh, you know, so if you're introducing more progressive taxation and then using that to fund social services, uh, improve rural education and health, uh, take care of migrants who move to the cities, you know, that's a, a more social democratic kind of agenda you know, that we've seen in lots of advanced capitalist countries. So I think uh, there's the potential for common prosperity to be taken in a direction that uh, is not is not bad for growth and actually addresses a lot of social concerns. Uh, but it's also possible to make it an excuse for beating up on the private sector. Uh, and that's almost certainly going to lead to capital flight and the flight of talent. Indeed. Um, and I just, I've noted, I follow too what's happening with the private sector, given everything, all the shakeup and the regulatory crackdowns as well too. But I was struck uh, that of course, another thing this Congress did was um, uh, revise the party constitution or party charter as it's more accurately translated. Um, and one thing they did not touch and they have not touched the last two times is the language about the role of the party in the private sector which is very different from the role of the party in SOEs and even in NGOs or, or social organizations as they're called too. So it's interesting to me that still the fundamental thing is it's a much lighter hand of the party. They don't require a party to be sitting on the board of directors or involved in major decisions of private companies, et cetera. So it seems to me the party's never been comfortable with the private sector, just like they're never comfortable with civil society, but they're both things that, that they need and that are contributing to China's economic growth and, and social stability as well. Um, we had a question from the audience, or did you want to respond to that or not? Okay. Uh, going back to this idea of Xi having lined up uh, people who agree with this point of view, this so-called war cabinet, as some people were calling it, uh, Sean Murphy, who's uh, Vice President of Dolby, points out that um, Putin was known to have done kind of the same thing that she is now being accused of doing by having a circle of sort of yes men who won't give him the real story and they're afraid of making mistakes. Um, and clearly we think that that helps uh, uh, explain the Kremlin's miscalculation about the invasion in Ukraine. Um, is this an accurate parallel you know, for what's happening with Xi's cabinet? Uh, and if so, he's smart and strategic. What explains this potential misjudgment on his part? Lee, well, uh, there are some similarities and uh, in Taiwan for, um, you know, promote uh, protégés to important position. But we should know that the Chinese leaders, uh, they differ profoundly from Russian leaders in a number of ways, partly because they deal with the two different countries. China is an emerging power, benefit from, from the post-Cold War international order and uh, economic liberalization. But uh, Russia is a declining power and uh, really suffer from the post, uh, you know, Cold War international order. And uh, also that uh, one of the important things that uh, I, we did not have time to discuss, many of the Chinese leaders are Western educated, I mean, including uh, this time, even uh, more than last time, last time, four members. This is based on definition of one year study overseas or, or degree candidate. Uh, last time, four people, uh, uh, Wang Funing, Liu He, uh, Chen Xi and Yang Jiechi this time actually double, you know, so uh, uh, you can see that the increase, this is actually very, very uh, 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 interesting or ironic at the time US-China relations deteriorated, but the Western, you know, educated elites continue to emerge and they enter the power bureau and, uh, and etc. Now also in, in five years, some of them will be more people will enter the power bureau standing committee. Uh, for example, that the, the Shanghai Party Secretary Chen Jining, if you look at the previous trade, the, uh, the, the, the track record that the Shanghai Party Secretary had a good chance to be in the Power Bureau Standing Committee. This guy spent 10 years uh, in, in London and including six years studying in the Imperial College, got his degree in environmental science and et cetera. So there are several other people in that kind of category. So I'm not that uh, overly pes pessimistic about that. Yes, sometimes some people say yes, man, but we should understand that Xi Jinping defeated the powerful two factions, you know, Tuan Pai and, uh, and the Princelings. Uh, but the, the, the factional politics, as Chairman Mao said, that always exists. 
you know, there were new factions who start emerge, and we should remember Xi Jinping was a protege of Jiang Zemin and Zheng Qinghong. Now look at him. So the same things, same dynamic will continue in the Chinese political process. So in that regard, I'm not overly pessimistic. Okay, great. Good way to end. We're out of time, so perfect way to, to do it. And clearly we still have a lot to digest and learn and watch for in the coming months, and especially the upcoming uh, National People's Congress meeting in March uh, may tell us some more. So I'll turn it over now to my colleague, Jonathan Stromseth. And thank you everybody for being here this morning. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Jonathan, uh, the Lee Kuan Yew Chair uh, at, at Brookings, uh, focusing on Southeast Asia and China. Um, now we will uh, kind of turn our lens outward uh, like a projector uh, to try to understand uh, how these domestic political trends that we've just discussed uh, are likely to be projected outside of China uh, and affect Chinese foreign policy uh, in the years ahead, including toward the Asia Pacific region, the United States and the world at large. We have already seen a very active uh, couple of weeks of Chinese diplomacy uh, since the party Congress ended, with Xi Jinping hosting uh, leaders from Vietnam, Germany, uh, Pakistan, uh, and Tanzania, as they all paid official visits uh, to Beijing. We are also uh, convening this discussion uh, just as uh, Xi Jinping is getting ready to join other regional and world leaders for a series of summits in Southeast Asia including a possible in-person meeting with Joe Biden uh, at the G20 summit, uh, which will be in Bali, Indonesia. Meanwhile, uh, tensions continue to uh, simmer over Taiwan uh, and foreign policy experts are trying to discern what the new personnel appointments or the language of the, the party Congress report could mean for the future of Taiwan and perhaps by extension for US-China uh, relations and the stability of the surrounding region. So uh, suffice to say, a lot is going on. Uh, fortunately, we have a very experienced and talented uh, group of experts uh, who can offer their analysis today and, and help us to uh, disentangle all the threads, so to speak. Uh, they are uh, Yun Sun, uh, Patricia Kim, uh, and Jonathan Pollack. So let me start with uh, Yun Sun, who is a non-resident fellow uh, at Brookings with our Africa Initiative. Uh, she also serves as co-director of the East Asia program and director of the China program at Stimson Center. She is a specialist on Chinese foreign policy, U.S.-China relations, and China's relations with neighboring and authoritarian regimes. Uh, Yun will kick off this discussion uh, by looking at the foreign policy leaders who were promoted at the party congress and what their elevation could mean for China's foreign relations going forward. She will also discuss uh, the recent charm offensive or flurry of diplomacy, as I mentioned, that we've seen in the aftermath of the Congress. So Yun, over to you. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, so we have seen a lot of foreign policy activities after the party Congress, and that was expected. We know that the year of 2022, uh, this year has not been particularly, particularly easy for China's foreign policy, given the COVID restriction, given the continued lockdown, and also given the Russian war in Ukraine. And a lot of the activities have been, um, have been suppressed in terms of the foreign engagement because of the, uh, the anticipation of the party Congress, which remained to be the top domestic priority. So now that the party congress is over, we see that the Chinese uh, foreign minister Wang Yi reaching out to his counterparts all over the world and Xi Jinping hosting Western um, and Asian leaders in, in Beijing. So we're, I assume that I suspect that we're going to see a pretty grandiose comeback party um, when Xi Jinping takes his trip to Southeast Asia later this month. Uh, on the issue of the key foreign policy leaders uh, within the foreign policy apparatus, um, for people uh, who are observing the development of the personnel changes, there have been quite some surprise. So first, among the 205 newly elected members of the Central Committee, we know five of them are from the foreign policy apparatus. They're Wang Yi, Liu Jianchao, uh, Liu Haixin, Qi Yu, and, and Qing Gang. And the Wang Yi has already passed the uh, the previous age limit in terms of the uh, the member for the members of the of the Politburo since he is already sixty nine years old. By the end of the uh, the current tenure, he will be seventy four, which is quite senior of an age coming to China's foreign policy leaders in recent decades. Liu Jianchao has been appointed to be the head of the CCID, the International Liaison Department. 
Uh, so that basically, well, Qi Yu comes from a um, primarily domestic political background. He currently serves as a uh, party secretary of the foreign ministry. So that leaves two candidates for the foreign, foreign minister's position, um, Liu Haixing and Ambassador Qinggang. Gang. So the rumor currently in Washington is that Ambassador Qing is not coming back to Washington. And the expectation is that he will get a promotion to become the uh, become the foreign ministry, min, uh, foreign minister. If you look at some of the characteristics of these five people, they do share some commonalities. I think the first one is that uh, none of the five, five top foreign policy officials really came from a traditional sense of US background. And that means came coming from the Department of North America at the Foreign Ministry and being responsible for managing US-China relations. So the only person, um, Wang Yi and Liu Jianchao have been more of an Asianist, have ser having served as ambassador in Asia, while Liu Jianchao, Qing Gang, and Liu Haixin, they all have relatively strong European background. So what that means is that Xi's foreign policy down the road continues to depart from uh, the focus of, of his predecessors who prioritized relationship with the United States. Most uh, manifested in the appointment of, in, at least in the past, of US hands as the top foreign policy officials, including, for example, uh, Li Zhaoxin and Yang Jiechi as a foreign minister. Um, secondly, I think the selection of the top foreign policy officials also demonstrate China's emphasis on public relations and public di diplomacy. I think it's no coincidence that two of the five officials, the top officials, Liu Jianchao and Qing Gang, have, been, have served as a foreign ministry spokesperson, as well as the heads of the uh, information office of the foreign ministry. And it is also no coincidence if Liu and Qing are appointed to be the top official in charge of party diplomacy and also the, uh, the, the nation's diplomacy. So there is a dire need from Beijing's perspective uh, for the ability to shape the international narrative and influence global public opinion about China. So having officials who specialize in public relations, I think is a clear push in this direction. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you very much, Yun. Um, we'll come back to some of uh, the topics you mentioned uh, when we get to the discussion phase. Um, now uh, we'll hear from uh, Patricia Kim, who is uh, the David Rubenstein Fellow at Brookings. Uh, where she holds an appointment uh, in the John Thornton China Center and the Center for East Asia Policy Studies. Uh, her areas of expertise uh, include Chinese foreign policy, U.S.-China relations, and East Asian politics and security more generally. Uh, uh, Patricia will uh, share some broad takeaways uh, of the Party Congress and what these takeaways could mean for the future trajectory of Chinese foreign policy, and we will also touch on uh, China's policy on Taiwan uh, and China's relations with Russia. Patricia? Well, thanks very much, Jonathan. It's really nice to join you and Yoon and, and Jonathan Pollock and other China Center colleagues for this timely conversation. Uh, watching the outcomes of the 20th Party Congress from the intense concentration of power in the hands of President Xi to the themes featured in his work report suggests to me that we can expect more continuity than change and essentially a doubling down on the more assertive foreign policies that have characterized Xi's previous two terms for the foreseeable future. Uh, while I don't think anyone was expecting a dramatic shift in China's approach to the outside world following the 20th Party Congress, uh, China's relations with many major and middle powers, including the United States, Europe, and states in the Indo-Pacific, have suffered during Xi's rule in uh, recent years. And I think the fact that the centrality of Xi and his signature policies were amplified rather than moderated at the Party Congress suggests that the Chinese political system is unwilling or unable at this time to engage in any sort of course correction. Um, with regards to Taiwan, Xi's work report at the 20th Party Congress consisted largely of familiar talking points. He made the case that Taiwan independence must be opposed, that all Chinese patriots must advance the cause of national reunification. Uh, he also gave the standard line that while China will do its utmost to strive for peaceful unification, it will not renounce the use of force and that it reserves the option of taking all measures necessary to achieve unification. 
Now, while Xi's work report uh, didn't shed much new light, if any, on Beijing's policy direction on Taiwan, I actually found uh, China's new white paper on Taiwan that was published this past August, right around Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan and the PLA's expansive military exercises that followed this visit, uh, useful in understanding Beijing's latest thinking on uh, its Taiwan policy. And I thought one of the most striking aspects of this paper was its elaboration of the one country, two systems model. And if you look at the paper, it makes the case that the two systems is subordinate to and derives from one country, and that the, the practice of one country, two systems has been a success in Hong Kong, where, quote, order was restored and prosperity returned, end quote. So I found this formulation uh, quite notable and quite a claim given Beijing's actions in Hong Kong are precisely what have discredited its one country, two systems framework in the eyes of the people of Taiwan and around the world. And I think it demonstrates to, to us the vast perception gap that exists between Chinese leaders' views and their foreign counterparts, particularly, particularly in, Europe, in the US, Europe, and key Asian states. Now, turning briefly to China-Russia, so Xi's work report did not elaborate upon China's uh, policies towards Russia or other specific states, which makes sense because the report was intended to set the direction of the party rather than China's foreign policies. Uh, Xi did not specifically reference the war in Ukraine while reiterating Beijing's uh, standard line that it supports the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all states. And his work report notably did not include a reference to the principle of indivisible security, which is this notion that states should not strengthen their security at the expense of the security of other states. And this is a principle that Moscow has leveraged to make the dubious case that um, the West and NATO had violated this principle and therefore it had no choice but to act in the way it has. The concept of indivisible security uh, also made an appearance in the China-Russia joint statement from February uh, of earlier this year, and it was cited as a key pillar in Xi Jinping's new global security initiative that he proposed at the Boao Forum in April of this year. Now, this, this global security initiative remains a rather vague concept, and it was mentioned just once without elaboration in Xi's work report for the party congress. But I think the fact that uh, indivisible security wasn't explicitly mentioned at the party Congress demonstrates that Beijing is sensitive to the criticism that it's received for refusing to clearly condemn Putin's war in Ukraine and to distance itself from Moscow. Uh, but nevertheless, I think a strong conviction remains in China that the US is strengthening its security at the expense of China's through various coalition, coalition building efforts in the Indo-Pacific. And this is the conviction that continues to underpin the strategic alignment that we see between China and Russia today. Um, and again, this partnership was reconfirmed in a phone call between Foreign Minister Wang Yi and Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov just days after the conclusion of the party Congress, uh, during which both sides expressed China and Russia's intentions to deepen exchanges and continue elevating their relationship. So let me stop here for now, and I'll turn it back to you, Jonathan. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Patricia. Uh, finally, uh, I'm delighted to bring in uh, Jonathan Pollack uh, to the discussion. Uh, Jonathan is a non-resident senior fellow, uh, also at the Thornton Center and Center for East Asia Policy Studies at Brookings, and uh, is affiliated with Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, from which he's uh, coming to us now, uh, where he teaches courses on Chinese foreign policy and international relations in Northeast Asia. Uh, Jonathan will discuss uh, the implications of the Party Congress for China-Japan relations, uh, as well as China's approach to the Korean Peninsula. Jonathan? This is a two Jonathan panel, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a delight to see all of you this morning um, and um, hope we can have a productive discussion on what I would have to describe as unanswered questions about China's foreign policy directions, um, since lo a lot has been left unsaid. Uh, and of course, you could argue that in any foreign policy context, China or anywhere else, um, you, you have the circumstances that you confront, but then the question becomes, what are the possibilities of, uh, in a, in a, in a, in a, I always have difficulty with the word, initiative, 
um, in foreign policy relative to uh, circumstances that that are that are that are readily confrontable or readily recognizable. Uh, I don't know that we have answers here. What we have, uh, of course, is a certain amount of code language for how to um, restrict activities of others, that is specifically the United States, that could potentially impede uh, on Chinese, imp impinge on Chinese interests. Um, and uh, given the centrality of the relations of, uh, with uh, US core allies uh, in Northeast Asia, specifically Japan and the Republic of Korea, uh, it, it raises the inevitable question of, is there any possibility for meaningful shifts in direction, et cetera, et cetera? And on that basis, uh, I would say in a near-term sense, uh, there doesn't seem to be much, uh, shall we say, eagerness for um, undertaking activities, new activities, a new language that could suggest a longer term trend uh, in uh, in Chinese foreign policy, at least as it pertains to Northeast Asia. It doesn't mean that that uh, Northeast Asia is is missing in action, but uh, the tone I got from the political report um, really suggested to the degree that you could infer anything about about uh, specific foreign policy questions is that there's a larger security context uh, that, uh, that China is confronting right now uh, with the United States uh, being far more active, uh, far more engaged uh, in ways that do impinge, uh, as the leadership in Beijing would say, on Chinese interests. The question is whether any of them, any of these uh, developments uh, compel China to rethink policy uh, directions. Um, so, if I could, uh, I would argue that you've got three, three very, very different systems here that China is, oper is operating with. You've got, again, uh, as a legacy of the past, relations with North Korea, but then you've got these much more consequential relationships that have evolved now with uh, Japan and, and with South Korea. But at a time that the United States uh, is being far more engaged with both of these partners to the degree that it opens the door for, for other kinds of possibilities. I don't see China in that context, uh, at this point at least, undertaking um, riskier strategies, but there's a, an, an, in, in, in a way, the undercurrent of foreign policy deliberations to the degree that we can determine them uh, suggests that China is trying to find a way to keep things steady, if you will. But in the realm like foreign policy with the kinds of actors we're talking about here, that's gonna be a very, very difficult thing to do. So it's a question of what resources China does or does not uh, put to use uh, in the in these initi initiatives now, obviously, with uh, Wang Yi's uh, background, experience, few have been as involved uh, over the years in China's foreign policy. I suspect that those trends uh, will continue with a heightened role for Wang Yi, um, but uh, it it doesn't really tell me or tell any of us what might evolve over a period of time if things don't work as planned, shall we say. Uh, and in foreign policy, they seldom do. Um, and so the challenge that China is confronting is how do you manage these very separate kinds of relationships you have with these key actors uh, in Northeast Asia? And can you do it in a way that underscores, number one, uh, China's centrality to any of the larger questions that might emerge with time. Uh, and number two, frankly, uh, to limit uh, wherever possible uh, a much more vi vigorous and uh, frontal relationship uh, or role of the United States in Northeast Asia. Uh, now, um, there's no uh, evidence that I can detect uh, that suggests that the US is about to back off its involvement here but 
the tools that we that, that, that the U.S. has or doesn't have uh, are going to affect the resources that China brings to bear uh, and whether or not um, and how uh, China rethinks or reassesses uh, its overall directions. I think the consequences may be greatest um, with respect to North Korea. Uh, North Korea is an endlessly frustrating uh, interactor uh, or interlocutor uh, for everyone involved, in, including the Chinese. Um, and now North Korea has been increasingly, to say that they're being increasingly isolated is kind of an understatement, but given uh, the, their own version of zero COVID policy, um, North Korea has just been, um, other than its activities with respect to military development, uh, its trade, although it's, the, it's bumped up the little a tiny bit, it's really kind of the missing actor. And I guess what I ask is, um, is North Korea, can North Korea sustain its international position and its domestic circumstances with um, such a problematic uh, set of policies, if they are policies? So um, this, is, this is the hand that China has been dealt. Uh, the, the question I would like to raise is simply whether or not China uh, in the coming uh, months or years, uh, begins to do more uh, in Northeast Asia relative to what might be just uh, you know the other opportunities on other fronts, uh, which we'll we'll talk about today. But I think I'll stop at that point, and we can come back. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Jonathan. And I, I think we'll we'll maybe take a little tour of the region uh, uh, with respect to sort of China's uh, neighborhood uh, diplomacy uh, and how that might be affected by what we saw at the Party Congress. Um, but let me let me start, uh, Patricia, with you and ask you a little bit about uh, the rumors or the the expectations that there might be an in person meeting uh, at the G20 uh, coming up in a, in a week or two uh, in Bali. Uh, between Xi and uh, Joe Biden. Um, do you see, uh, well, what are the prospects uh, of that meeting? And uh, if it happens, do you see some possibilities for a lowering of tensions or perhaps for any new bilateral initiatives? Or is that maybe too much to expect? Well, thanks, Jonathan. Um, as you said, the meetings has still not been officially confirmed, although the expectations are that it will happen. Um, at a minimum, I expect both leaders to use their first in-person conversation since uh, Biden took uh, the presidential office to put their key concerns on the table. And for the U.S. in recent months, uh, the priority has been warning uh, China. The priority has been warning China about not aiding Russia's uh, war efforts in Ukraine. And for China, this has included object objections to the United States Taiwan policies. So I expect this sort of putting the key issues on the table as they have been on the virtual calls. Um, I imagine export restrictions and other hot button issues will also be on that list. I would personally count the meeting as a success or as, as um, you know, uh, more than just sort of a laundry list of airing grievances if the two leaders are able to signal a willingness to resume working level discussions in areas of mutual interest. And this could be restarting official exchanges on climate change that were paused by Beijing after Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, or elevating discussions on non-proliferation, and in particular, addressing another critical hotspot that Jonathan Pollack began to talk about, and that's the Korean Peninsula, where North Korea's unabated expansion of its nuclear and missile program is raising the risk of conflict in the region. Uh, last December, when Biden and Xi had a virtual dialogue, one promising area that I saw come to the forefront was this uh, potential agreement for working level consultations on advancing strategic stability, which is this broad term that includes risk reduction and crisis management, uh, particularly in the nuclear realm. But before we saw any uh, real working level efforts come to fruition, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. China was seen as complicit in this invasion, given its declaration of a no limits partnership with Russia just weeks before the invasion and, and given Beijing's refusal to explicitly condemn Moscow. And I think all of this essentially shut down any hopes 
for the strategic stability conversations with Beijing. Um, but if we see um, sort of nods towards restarting this, I think I would count that as progress. And, and overall, I think just a lot of work is needed to move the US-China relationship in a more constructive uh, direction that allows the two states to engage in healthy competition in a way that allows for risk reduction and conflict management, as well as coordination on existential and common global interests. And this is where I'd like to make a plug for a new report uh, that I've just written with uh, two of my Brookings colleagues, Ryan Hass and Jeff Bader. And in this report, we outlined five policy recommendations on how the US might recalibrate its China policy to better advance US interests. And so I, I, I realize time is short and so I can't go over all of the details here, but I do urge members of the audience who are interested to check out the report uh, on our website. Um, we lay out ways of how the United States can establish a more favorable environment around China for US interests, while at the same time building a more durable and productive working relationship with China. And so um, again, encourage folks to check out the report. Uh, thanks, Patricia. I, I looked at the report last night and I would also urge uh, all those who are interested uh, to take a look and, and see how, how uh, a policy rooted in US interests in particular uh, uh, is laid out. Uh, and uh, it's a very good report. Um, I, I, I kind of want to ask a, a kind of fundamental question, uh, maybe first uh, to you, Jonathan, but you uh, and if you want to jump in as well. The question is, uh, with so much talk, Xi Jinping, you know, how important is Xi himself? Um, I lived in China from roughly 2006 to 2014, and it was clear to me that China's domestic political environment was beginning to tighten uh, before Xi came to power in, in 2012, 2013, suggesting that, you know, these domestic trends emerged from kind of a broader institutional set of changes within the party itself and probably were not attributable to one man. So sort of turning externally again, you know, could the same be said about the growing assertiveness of Chinese foreign policy in recent years and on into the future? To what extent is it uh, a broader institutional trend if we're looking at the domestic sources of foreign policy? Uh, or is it really attributable largely to Xi himself? Uh, did he just put you know, the foot on the gas pedal? Any thoughts? Uh, I, I'm going to ask uh, Yun what, what she thinks about this, uh, but maybe I'll jump in uh, after that. But I think that this is something that very much fits in her in her overall. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan. That's a great question. I remember. <laughs> I remember going to Beijing in 2015 and asking exactly the same question. I remember meeting with a group of officials from NDRC and we were talking about BRI. And my question was. I was being bold, I was young. I was asked, so I asked them the questions and well, had Hu Jintao have another four year, another five years, another term, do you think that China would have launched BRI? And do you think that the Chinese foreign policy would be on the same trajectory as we are seeing today? I think the room just froze. They all stared at each other like, oh, we don't know how to answer this question. Um, but I think it does say something about the leadership factor in the foreign policy making of China. Well, for foreign policy analysis, we all, we all know there is a three level analysis. There's a leadership level, there is a state level, and also there is international system level. And I don't think that any one factor will be, uh, will be the sole, sole culprit for where, where China is today. But remember these three factors, they, they influence each other. Once the foreign, uh, the, the leadership personality sets a foreign policy in a certain direction, it will affect how the state acts. And it will affect how the international system perceives that change and react to that change, which is why that I find it very, extremely difficult for China to reverse or change its direction, even if the top leader wants to have a change of direction because the international system or the international community may not be able to produce that reciprocity that will be necessary to 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 accelerate or to fit into that uh, the dynamic that interaction uh, cycle. 
So which is to say that I do think that Xi is important. I think a different Chinese leader would not have adopted maybe the same direction, but definitely not the same style. It's like when we talk about the difference between the China policy of the Trump administration and the Biden administration, are they really different? If you think about the essence of the policy and the context of strategic competition between US and China, but people do agree that the styles are significantly different and they do matter. Thank you. Could I, uh, uh, Jonathan, uh, could I jump in here uh, based on something that you did raise and something I should have highlighted a bit more uh, in my remarks uh, is that um, in 2017 and 2018, again, under Xi Jinping, uh, we saw the extraordinary developments uh, on the Korean Peninsula, but just specifically highlighted by North Korea's increasing uh, weapons testing and the like, and of course, uh, Mr. Trump's own interventions in this. Um, and it was Xi Jinping who, again, going back to code language, made statements or used argu arguments or used language that uh, we were not accustomed to with respect to China in some measure diverging, diverging from the time-honored traditions of um, policies toward the Korean Peninsula. Now, Xi may have done this or th those around him may have uh, urged that there had to be a way that given the, the dangers that were posed uh, on China's border uh, by North Korea, uh, that China had very little uh, alternative other than to A, cooperate more with the United States on different kinds of UN or, you know, sanctions and the like, um, and uh, more generally to impose costs on North Korea. Uh, and these were undertaken in a significant way, much more significant than we are used to in that precise period. Uh, but um, since, the, um, si since that time, uh, what we see is um, uh, in effect, China reverting in some measure to some of the you know, standard language that is used, putting the onus on the United States and others uh, to um, make modifying, modify their policies with respect to North Korea when, as we all know, uh, China really doesn't have that kind of direct um, involvement and influence over North Korea that some might assume that you can in effect you know, that, that the leadership in Pyongyang, given its dependence uh, on China, would have no alternative but to accommodate uh, in one way or another. But, you know, frankly, um, the, you know, the persistence of the nuclear weapons program, the expansion of the nuclear weapons program, and widespread expectations, at least as voiced by the Biden administration, that uh, North Korea is on the cusp of another nuclear weapons test. So this would be an interesting question, more than interesting, uh, about how and whether China would yet again, as in the 2017 period, uh, impose costs on North Korea, despite the fact that uh, superficially at least, uh, North Korea has drawn closer to China yet again. Uh, but the risk here, I think, for China in part is if the United States uh, deepens its involvement because of its own vital security interests, this puts China potentially um, uh, backfoots China to some extent. So what can China therefore do, if anything, uh, to shift the terms of reference? Uh, and how, if at all, does this affect uh, China's dealings with both Korea, South Korea, and Japan, which are core U.S. partners, uh, and where the U.S. has tried, at least on paper, to emphasize the increase uh, in uh, alliance re relations, alliance involvement, um, in ways that uh, does begin to impinge on China's relative freedom of movement, if, if we could use that kind of term. Uh, terminology. So these are questions that I think that China and Xi Jinping himself has to be asked, or those that he deputizes here, uh, to to deal with what 
still uh, is uh, the risks of a much larger potential crisis uh, on the peninsula. Uh, and I don't know that we have a clear indication yet of what they will do, but the last thing I think that Xi Jinping and others in the leadership would want uh, is to see Northeast Asia uh, embroiled in um, a heightened crisis that really compels China to then re react in significant ways um, to protect its own interests and to avoid something, uh, a, a, larger, a larger crisis. Those are the kinds of things that I think we ought to be keeping our, our, our eyes on. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. I'd like to continue with this theme in a broad sense, uh, by which I mean kind of China's relations with its immediate uh, neighborhood. Um, and you, you and I uh, share a strong interest in, in Southeast Asia, in, including China's relations with uh, Southeast Asia. Um, and, uh, you know, I think what we've seen in, in the last decade or so uh, since Xi came to power is a more assertive Chinese foreign policy there. Um, it's possible one could see that in a broader framework uh, where China uh, has shifted away from hiding strengths and biding time or hide and bide, as it's sometimes called a strategy of Deng Xiaoping, which emphasized uh, relations with major powers, especially toward a shift toward a much more proactive uh, uh, neighborhood diplomacy, where at least in my view, uh, Southeast Asia is seen as a kind of testing ground or platform uh, for China's rise in some ways. Also a real hotbed of US-China competition and a place where all these summits are about to happen. I'm just wondering, you know, do you agree with that uh, uh, kind of sense of the trajectory? Uh, and after the party Congress, do you see it continuing? Um, thank you, Jonathan. I think on Southeast Asia, but which the region that you 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 are one of the top experts in the whole world, uh, I would say there's a difference between mainland Southeast Asia and maritime Southeast Asia. And given the maritime dispute in the South China Sea, that yes, the Chinese approach towards South China Sea has been categorized as uh, as assertive, and some e would even say aggressive. But if you look at the, the development in mainland Southeast Asia, especially, I'm sorry to say, the regression of liberal democracy in mainland Southeast Asia in the past couple, of, past couple of years, I would say that Southeast Asia might, including mainland Southeast Asia, might have a lot of concerns about China's growing assertiveness in their region, uh, but their relationship with the United States has not necessarily improved because of the domestic development and also because uh, I would say all the distractions in the US foreign policy. Well, we always say that Southeast Asia, is it important for the United States? Yes, it always is important. But coming to, for example, the, the foreign travel schedule of, uh, of Secretary Blinken or of top U.S. leaders, Southeast Asia yearly does not merit the priority. So I think that also sends a signal to the region. But at the end of the day, it depends on what kind of options the region has, right? So like, for example, when we discuss the uh, Indo-Pacific economic framework, there was a lot of noises, a lot of anticipation about what the framework will bring to the region. But by the end of the day, the region will judge its validity and value and their benefits to their region based on what is the dollar number that the U.S. is willing to put on the table. And that, unfortunately, is also where China, I would say, uh, does a, a, a terrific job because the Chinese are always willing to put cash on the table, especially in a region that is directly on uh, on China's border. So if, I'm afraid that the competition will continue and the Southeast Asia will be stuck in the middle and refusing to make a choice. And you always hear them, them saying, do not force us to choose. But I would say that it's a pretty good place to have the options. Yeah, and I think right. that's, where, that's where they are. Thank you. Um, I wanna to get to a couple of questions from the audience, but before we do, uh, you and I was wondering if you could touch briefly on whether uh, the party Congress shed any new light. Uh, you mentioned it earlier, so I'm coming back to it. You said BRI, uh, which of course is the uh, vaunted Belt and Road Initiative uh, or infrastructure, global infrastructure initiative, uh, also very prominent in Southeast Asia. Um, did uh, the party Congress shed any new light on the future uh, of that uh, initiative uh, or others like the Global Development Initiative that it announced about a year ago, but we're still trying to understand what that is. 
Absolutely. BRI was introduced in 2013 as a flagship form strategy of Xi Jinping, right? In the past 10 years, we've seen that BRI basically being the champion of China's foreign policy initiative and its engagement with the world. It's like the key word of China's overseas, uh, overseas engagement. Uh, but we're also seeing that the genesis or the development of BRI is not static. So I would say that BRI started very uh, with a very high bar, very high tide. And within three years, you see the Chinese swarming into the foreign financing for mega infrastructure projects all over the world. And that's for the first, I would say the first stage of BRI that everyone was trying to, everyone in China, including private sector, state-owned enterprises and the government agencies tries to participate, think of what we can contribute towards BRI. So we saw a, a peak of the Chinese financing, especially loans, both commercial and concessional loans being made towards BRI countries. But then starting from 2017 to 2019, we see the Chinese becoming much more careful about their narrative. That is not a cap, it's not a feast of capital. Now we need to be more careful about how we make our loan decisions because I think by that point, China already anticipated the debt sustainability issue, which has been exacerbated by the COVID crisis in the past three years. So moving forward, I think BRI will continue to be uh, to be a, a an upward or a keyword in China's foreign policy. Like in the 20th Party Congress report, we saw that the BRI was only referenced twice both in terms of China's, well, one in China's contribution to the world and the other one in terms of the China's continued determination to open up to the and to engage the world economy. So down the road, BRI as Xi Jinping's signature form strategy is not going to be declared a, a failure, I want to say. But we do see that the narrative is morphing more and more towards global development initiative. Then the, the, the caveat is, what is the difference between BRI and Global Development Initiative? I think it's a mentality, it's a, it's a perspective. BRI is something Chinese. It has a Chinese identity labeled on its head since day one, right? So it inevitably projects a perception of, well, this is Chinese and it's China versus the world. But the Global Initiative changes that, uh, that perception or that framing. Now China is a part of the global community and this is global development initiative. So you can hardly say that, oh, this is China's global development initiative. Mm -hmm. So I think that framing is going to be a significant distinction where we will be seeing down the road. Thank you. Thanks, Sian. So we have a few minutes left and I wanna make sure that we get a few questions from the audience. Um, let me uh, direct this one uh, to you, Patricia. Uh, so, um, Donald Schur of Kumamoto University uh, asks, what are the best and worst scenarios for U.S.-China relations as Xi Jinping enters his third term? How can the worst be avoided and the best case scenarios possibly be achieved? Well, thanks very much, Jonathan and Donald. Um, that's, the, that's a very great question. I think the worst case scenario, obviously, is walking into a war that neither side wants or benefits from. And of course, um, the area where the world's attention is on is in the Taiwan Strait, where we've seen um, growing Chinese military activities, as well as um, growing pressure on leaders here in the United States and in the leaders of Taiwan to do more, to sort of um, to counter this Chinese pressure, and, and that's leading to uh, rising tensions. And so walking into a war in, that, in the Taiwan Strait would be devastating for all involved, and it's something that we really need to avoid. Uh, what is the best case scenario? Again, I think it would be establishing a productive working relationship between the United States and China, even as competitive dynamics remain front and center um, in this in this relationship. And I think, um, you know, this is where there's a question about what is the best way to frame the U.S.-China relationship. And the proposition that the Biden administration has made is that whether you're um, that the U.S.-China relationship should really be multifaceted, right? It should involve uh, elements of, of competition, confrontation when necessary, as well as cooperation in areas of common interest. And I think this is a very realistic formulation. Um, it's one that could be used to describe any relationship, frankly. 
whether you're dealing with friendly states or adversaries, you will always have conflicting interests or, and common interests as well. It's a fact of life. And so I think making, uh, making sure that we can move in this direction it will be very important. I think where we've seen a lot of progress under the Biden administration is really beefing up the cooperation among like-minded allies and partners, especially in the Indo-Pacific, where we've seen less progress is on building a more productive US-China relationship, as I said. And so I, I wanna be clear that this is not because the Biden administration hasn't tried. In fact, I think a lot of the resistance has come from Beijing that has rejected this notion that you can both cooperate and confront at the same time. Um, I don't think this works well, but I think if it's a framing question, we need to figure out how do we find a framework that everyone could agree to, but it's really the substance that matters. And I think it's not in China's interest, not in the United States interest, nor the rest of the world's interest, if the two of, of, the, of the largest powers are not talking. And this is where I'll make one last point. Um, I think there's this oversimplified narrative here in Washington that has taken hold that the United States decades long policy of engagement uh, with China failed because China didn't turn out to be a liberal democracy. And I think this is a very historically inaccurate view of what engagement was supposed to be about. Um, engagement somehow has become a dirty word, but really engagement is just another word for communication, negotiations between states and the original intent of opening relations between the United States and China in the second half of the Cold War was based on the recognition that it made no sense for the two, uh, two of the world's greatest powers to have no working ties and that it was necessary to have open channels of communication so that both sides could advance their respective interests. So I would hope that we can move in this direction. I would hope that if there is a Biden-Xi meeting um, at the G20, that, that, they, that the two leaders could take the initiative to, to really build up this track that has been neglected. Thanks, Patricia. We have uh, just about two minutes left. Um, looking at you, Jonathan, uh, there's another question uh, from Lise Corson of the Bridge Institute, which is very simple. What is the most effective deterrence against China? Would you like to answer that or, 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 or play off of Patricia's uh, very interesting response to all of these questions are kind of about US-China policy in a way. What, what are your thoughts? Um, the, the question here, obviously, and the comparison here with the earlier years of US engagement with China bears reference, as, uh, as Patty Kim has noted, um, that uh, those were fueled, the old engagement strategy was fueled, um, of course, by a common perception of threat uh, coming primarily from the Soviet Union, or at least that was the way it was presented. Um, now we're in a situation where there is no common perception of threat, uh, though you could argue that, um, you know, other kinds of initiatives, uh, climate change, what have you, but they don't quite have the same they just don't have the same resonance. Uh, and we are in this era now of a much more competitive relationship with China at the same time that we do not have the kinds of meaningful interaction with China uh, in face-to-face -face dealings. Um, it's, it's just not the same. So if it becomes more a kind of a uh, slogans, if you will, dueling slogans, uh, then, then we're really stuck and you can only hope that there is no uh, breakdown. Uh, but uh, you know that's one of the causes of concerns for my unease. If we agree that major powers uh, have to have tools at their disposal, or they talk to one another, interact with one another on a regular basis, communicate, and when you don't, uh, that's when really, really miserable stuff happens. Uh, and uh, I just wonder whether if we proceed, proceed at a level that, you know, we are not dealing, they are, Chinese are not dealing with us, and we are not dealing with Chinese. Uh, that's a recipe, frankly, for very, very no negative stuff down the road, and maybe not in the far too distant future. So you hope all great powers will restrain their activities, um, uh, communicate when they see their vital interests at risk um, and do whatever you can to limit the dangers and to limit the risks. That's, it seems like a modest 
some almost self-evident proposition, but it's almost like we need to relearn uh, this uh, because a lot of it is not evident right now. Uh, and that is uh, a real a real loss. A real Thank you, uh, Jonathan, for those cogent and, and wise thoughts as we look to the future of the U.S.-China relationship in the context of, of uh, the party Congress that we've been discussing for two hours now. I want to thank you, uh, Yun and Patricia, uh, for your wise thoughts uh, across the board. Um, and I particularly want to thank uh, the audience uh, for joining us today, uh, offering good questions. Uh, we hope this has been a useful discussion and uh, look forward to seeing you again uh, here at Brookings in the future. Thank you very much.